Good evening. Thank you all for coming. My name is Dean Godson. I'm Director of Policy Exchange. It's uh, wonderful to be able to reopen uh, the season in this brief uh, parliamentary session of a fortnight with uh, some serious uh, thought leadership. Our guests of honour or our two uh, panellists who are engaged uh, in dialogue uh, with each other, uh, both uh, best known in uh, the realm we're talking about, um, Amber Rudd, obviously, is former Home Secretary, Michael Ch Chertoff, former US Homeland Security <coughs> Secretary, one, one of the oldest and most venerable uh, UK departments of state and US Department of Homeland Security, not exactly analogous, but uh, close enough as, of course, the creation of nine, after 9-11. And Michael Chertoff, of course, was the uh, second uh, Homeland uh, Security Secretary there uh, during uh, the uh, second Bush administration. And uh, we're here, obviously, to launch his uh, new book, Exploding Data, and this uh, exercise uh, in uh, thought leadership and Michael uh, very modestly uh, describes himself as he's not a digital native, but he is a digital immigrant. And I suspect uh, he speaks for many of us uh, in that department. I hope, so. I hope I don't get deported. <laughs> That's a bit touchy for me at the moment. So. <laughs> that was spontaneous, by the way. There was, there was, you might think we were practicing in front of the mirror beforehand. I just uh, want to say uh, thank you to all who uh, uh, organized uh, this, including uh, the publishers, but also particularly uh, say a particular word of thanks to uh, Paddy McGuinness, former uh, UK Deputy National Security Advisor, only retired a few months ago. We thought, uh, thanks to running votes in the House of Commons, that we were almost going to uh, lose Amber. But uh, Paddy, very generously, always ahead of the game, having read uh, Michael Chertoff's book, uh, was willing to step in at the last minute. So, in fact, I'd always want to see Paddy emerge from the shadows and that kind of thing. But uh, <laughs> it, we were deprived of the pleasure on this occasion. But we will try uh, and out him another time. So thank you, Paddy. Thank you all, um, Amber, over to you. Half an hour uh, of discussion between our two panellists, then half an hour of uh, questions from the audience. Usual policy exchange house rules. No question too outrageous. You just have to state your name and organisation first. So thank you both for coming. Thank you, Michael. Look forward to hearing what you <coughs> have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dean, and thank you, Michael, for coming here today. And I must say, I devoured this book. Um, it is absolutely on the topic at the moment. Every time you switch on the radio or listen to the news, people are talking about data, whether the fair exchange of data is taking place, whether we're right to give up so much of it for no cost at all, and the consequences of that to our <coughs> privacy and to our security. And at the core of what I know <coughs> Michael was trying to do and I was trying to do in terms of security was trying to keep people safe and getting that balance between privacy and security. And in this book, Michael, you look at the legislation that might be needed in order to respond to the changes that are taking place with data transfers. But the, the concern that I have that you do refer to as well in here, but I'd be interested in your view, is about the public. Because the public tend to start from the position of my data is my data. I don't want the nasty government having it. Um, and yet in everything that we do, we need to have more data in order to keep them safe. And what you've revealed in your book, and I think is increasingly something that the public are becoming aware of, is that they have given their data away so freely. There is a lot of information out there. What can we do to give the public more confidence that uh, we're the government and we're here to help? <coughs> Well, well um, first of all, Amber, thank you very much for doing this. And I appreciate it, and I, I really um, uh, am grateful for your, your high praise, which is, which is you know, significant indeed. So I would say this. I would say if you went back several years, maybe two or three years ago, uh, the U.S. Uh, population generally was somewhat skeptical of the government, although, to be honest, when it came to counterterrorism, most people were pretty willing to tolerate a fair amount of collection of, of intelligence. And I would say the public was absolutely indifferent to what the private sector was doing. And I'll tell you a story about uh, one of the things that resonated with me was I was talking to somebody who was uh, you know, just a, a friend. And they were saying that they had been getting ads on their device for dating sites. And they were curious as to why that happened. And they said, you know, it's kind of strange because I've, I'm in the middle of a divorce. And it's odd this should be cropping up. And I asked her, well, when, when you're on email, what are you, who are you emailing with about this? She goes, well, I'm e emailing with my lawyer. I said, well, you understand that what's happening is maybe not a human being, but some machine is reading the emails to your lawyer and is determining that you are now eligible to date. 
So I said to myself, wow, if when I was in government, I had, without a warrant, surveilled someone's ongoing email between them and their lawyer, I'd be in jail now. Mm. But in the private sector, it was totally okay. And that made me realize that it was, in the public eye, yeah. there was a dissonance. I will say in the last two years, uh, public attitude has changed somewhat. And I think people have become aware, because of things like Cambridge Analytica, that actually um, social media is not merely like the telephone company where you just send messages back and forth, but they're agnostic. It is actually playing a role with the data, and it is monetizing it. And I, so I think now we're beginning to see a change in public attitudes. Yeah, okay, well that I, well, I think is, is, is very welcome. Um, but what you also touch on here is the issue of the Fourth Amendment in the US and how there is a difference between the UK and the US and that, and I know that because when I went over to the US on several occasions and worked with some of your successors, on how we were going to get terrorist material taken offline. Um, when we went and they came with me to uh, Google and Facebook in Silicon Valley, there was, everyone was always quoting the Fourth Amendment saying, well, you know, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. And I kept on pushing back and saying, as, as your um, successors did, saying we are still just dealing with terrorist material, right. with getting you to stick to the terms of your, of your, of your terms and agreement. And I, I would be interested in your views on how far that has moved in the public arena in terms of this very protectiveness about government should stay off the platforms because we're different as the US, we're different in terms of freedom of speech. I, I think as far as freedom of speech is concerned um, and freedom of the press, which is also it's actually the First Amendment contained in, in that amendment, I think people still believe in that and support it, but I will agree with you that I think they tend to be somewhat less absolutist than the lawyers and the judges mm -hmm. are. But I will say this, um, contrary to, to myth, uh, not all speech is free. Child pornography is not permissible. Incitement is not permissible. Um, I would argue recruiting is not permissible. Conspiracy is not permissible. Where you get into a challenging issue sometimes is drawing the line between incitement and advocacy. So if I argue that you know, it's, it's fair for a terrorist group to be attacking such and, such and so because they have a grievance, that may not be considered an incitement under American law. If I say, go out, get behind the wheels of your, of your car, and run somebody over in the name of whatever ideology, that is incitement. You can take that off. So I, again, I think there the public is probably less concerned um, with free speech. Part of the challenge we have, though, now is we have a lot of discussion about fake news mm -hmm. and the impulse to take fake news off platforms. And that raises the question, well, who decides what's fake? Yep. And there are some people who think fake news is anything they don't want to read about. And one of them is in the Kremlin, uh, because I know the Russians have a view of cybersecurity that includes keeping information out of the country that they view as unfriendly or uh, not positive. So that's, again, making the whole discussion a little more fraught. Yes. So one of the things I discovered was that when we went to talk to the social media platforms and asked them to take certain action, to take terrorist material down, and perhaps to communicate with us more confidently about who might have been putting that material up and who might have taken down, their, their objection to that was always that, well, if we do this for you, we'll have to do it for China or we'll have to do it for someone else. Someone to do it someone who might not use that material in quite such a benign way. Do you think that is a reasonable objection from those companies who are gathering all this data, that they should have one way of treating all countries because they don't want <coughs> to be in the business of making a decision about which country is going to use it fairly and which isn't? I, you know, I, I understand the argument. It, it, it's not, it, it has some merit. I think the challenge is, and you're seeing it now, for example, Google pulled out of China, and now they're trying to decide whether to get back in. The Chinese are not giving you an option, and increasingly the Russians are not giving you an option. The, they say to you, if you want to play here, this is what you have to do. And so the, country, the, the companies have to balance the attractiveness of the market with whether they are in fact treating their Chinese customers in China differently than their British or their American customers. Um, the argument I sometimes hear from the companies is, well, look, we have to live with the laws in the place that we operate. Um, and that's true, but then if you make that argument, it's hard to argue that I can't do something in the UK or the US because it's gonna set a bad example yeah. since you're, you've already given the game up. 
Yeah. I mean, you, you gave some fascinating examples in here, like the one you gave us earlier, about uh, individuals basically, in a way, losing their freedom of choice because there's so much information that's collected on them that they're being given all this information which they're just thinking is a coincidence, but it's basically just playing into what they were thinking about having in a way. They're getting their mind knowing better than in a way they thought they knew themselves, which is a sort of shocking thought, really. But what about the area that you did also write about in here in terms of hostile state activity? Because we've seen that today, we were just discussing it earlier, the um, US Intelligence Committee is got, has got Facebook and Jack Dorsey from Twitter in front of them. Do you think that we can make progress from them volunteering to be more frank about transparency, about where the accounts are from, in order to inform <coughs> the public that these are thousands of Russian bots, not genuine residents? Or do you think that, as, as I, I think that Senator Mark Warner was suggesting today, that the Senate should take over more and try and actually legislate this? Well, I, I, so I, I separate uh, two types of problems with the information operations. One is the efforts to manipulate the search engines uh, by either having botnets, which are basically zombie computers, or having troll farms who are basically paid to drive stories, or by impersonating people, or by having foreigners buying ads on social media. These are all things which are not free speech in my mind. Yeah. It could be regulated. In fact, we have regulations in political campaigns. A foreign government can't buy an ad or contribute to a candidate. And a foreigner is restricted in what they can do in terms of contributions. So I think that's a category of things where you could very well have government involvement. It may not be necessary because I think the platforms now realize it from, from the standpoint of their own market position, they should be addressing this. The area where I would not let the government get involved is, again, looking at the content. Uh, because except for those narrow ex exceptions I've talked about, um, if you don't like what somebody says, um, the government doesn't have the right to say, I'm going to ban it. And that's a very hard over rule in the United States. And if you consider some of the expressions you sometimes hear from government officials about their view of the press and their view of fake news, you begin to appreciate the wisdom of having a very hard and fast rule about not letting the government be the censor on the content yeah, of speech. Yeah, yeah. You can loathe what people say, but still defend their right Correct. to say it, which is absolutely right. Um, I mean, we've been looking here in the UK about whether there is uh, the need for more legislation. We've actually done, with US uh, help, I think quite a good job for getting a lot of terrorist material taken down offline. But in a way, I think that's because it's so cut and dried. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, other elements aren't. But in terms of election interference, which is, I know, uh, the heart really of what's going on which, uh, in the US, a lot of it from Russia, as we know, um, do you, you know, there has been a case for saying, as long as you can reveal where it's coming from and what's going on, then the public can make their judgments. That is what happened when Macron was being elected. You know, just before he, he was actually elected, he had a press conference with the French journalist, and he said, this is what you're going to encounter. We know the Russians are going to come after us. And it kind of spiked it, yeah. and he, he saw it off in that way. Do you not think that that might be sufficient if we are able to make the public more aware what to look out for? I think that's an important step. Um, and I think the, the, the key is to make it credible. And to give you an example, and I know you just had charges levied here against a couple of Russians. Um, a few months ago, the special counsel charged 12 Russians with interference in the elections. And in our country, we have very detailed indictments, which are charging documents. And the, the level of detail, I think, made it very persuasive, including, by the way, the fact it wasn't all done online. It was a little bit like a television thriller. They actually sent people over to do things in order to stimulate unrest and, and, and uh, dissension. I think that does have an effect on people. Now, I, I, you know, I don't know what it's like here. There will be some people who will not care. Yeah. But that's true of almost anything. I mean, we, the, some of the conspiracy uh, material that floats around on the internet is laughable, but you can still get some people to buy it. Oh, yes. But I do think that the, the Identifying and tagging what is being driven by foreign influence is an important step. I agree. I, I basically, I agree with that. But do you think you, you describe yourself as uh, an, an, an immigrant? It's perfectly right, though. It's perfectly right. Very welcome. Um, but I jumped over the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but um, do you think perhaps the younger generation won't, because they are so fluent, won't have the same difficulties as 
uh, the older generation have? Do you think it's a generational issue? Well, no, actually, I, I, what I hope is, I think it's an educational issue. Mm -hmm. um, I hope we are teaching in school uh, something about literacy in terms of evaluating the media. I was in Sweden last week, and it was very interesting. The Swedes actually teach people in their you know, grade school uh, media literacy. How do you understand whether a story is real? How do you read it critically? And I think we need to start doing that. Yeah. I mean, I, every time I hear somebody, a young person say to me, oh, it's got to be true. I saw it on the internet. I, I kind of, you know, blanch because that's not by any means the marker of truth. No, no, no. I, I get equally irritated when they say it must be true. I read it on Wikipedia. Right. <laughs> you know, you by know. the way, just on a Wikipedia story, at one point, my Wikipedia entry suddenly developed, a, I developed a middle initial, oh. which I don't have. But I never corrected it because I, it was a little bit like a barium uh, <laughs> thing that you swallow. Whenever anybody sent me a letter with a middle initial, I knew where they were getting the information. <laughs> so I think they finally removed it. But, but what was the motive of someone putting it? It was probably just a mistake. <laughs> but um, it, it was a, a useful mistake. Yes. OK, so, so staying, if we may, on a sort of hostile state activity um, and the growth of cyber attacks, and you have an interesting chapter towards the end here about cyber defense and cyber offense, um, do you think we should have more uh, international legislation around trying to have uh, some, some common, t common agreements on cyber defense and offense? Uh, I think it's a really hot topic yeah. right now. And uh, I've been talking about this. I was in Scandinavia, and I've been talking about it here as well. Um, and I, I'd come at this not being naive about the prospect of agreements with the Russians and the Chinese, because there are many things we are not going to agree on. That being said, even as we did in the height of the Cold War, I think there is value in trying to reach some agreement on some things. So, for example, um, you know, I think we could agree that using cyber tools to take out hospitals or knock commercial airliners out of the sky is something we, we should all agree is off limits. And right now I'm engaged in a project with what's called the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace to kind of develop norms such as don't attack the public core of the internet such that you destroy anybody, everybody's ability to use it. Um, and also a conference I did yesterday on protecting the global financial system. Now the challenge is this. First of all, there are many areas where we disagree with the Russians and the Chinese. But there are some where I think they have a self-interest that is sufficiently like ours that they might agree to it, and that could create a, a norm. Now, the second challenge is, of course, there'll be cheating. And that gets us to the very difficult issue of attribution. When someone cheats or does something destructive, how do you determine who did it? It's relatively easy, as you know, on the technical side to track back where the, the bits and bytes came in terms of going through servers. But then you have the problem of, well, who directed it to happen? And in Estonia, when they were attacked in 2007, uh, it came from Russia. But the Russian government said, not us, it's patriotic hackers. So that's another challenge in this, in this domain. Well, I mean, my concern is that if you start having international arrangements like that, you're assuming other countries are going to work by the same moral compass that you are. Yeah. And you referred earlier to the fact that today the Prime Minister announced that we had, we have the names and we have identified uh, who the two Russian intelligence officers were mm -hmm. who attempted the murder of the Skripals in March. Now, the Russians have denied it from the moment it happened. Mm -hmm. And they put out this fog of propaganda the whole time. We now have the evidence. They will continue to deny yeah, it. Of course. So, I worry slightly that any sort of international cyber agreement is going to just give them the advantage of knowing a little bit more about what we do, and we will just continue to get from them what us? No, absolutely not. But I think what one thing, and I think this gets to the issue of deterrence mm -hmm. uh, and, and attribution. I think part of what an agreement does is it gives law-abiding countries the authority to engage in countermeasures, and more vigorous countermeasures than would be the case in the absence of a norm. And um, as I think we see with respect to the sanctions being levied against, against the Russians because of what they did um, here in, in, the, in the United Kingdom. So I do think there's some value to this. But you have to be willing to police it and to enforce it. And not to set such a high bar that you uh, let people get away with it by somebody denying it. Sometimes yeah. you have yeah. to be able to 
override that. I, I, I agree that there's only a purpose in attribution if you've got something to follow it up with. Correct. And actually, when we attributed uh, at the end of March to the, uh, on the script piles, we got a very good international response, which was very welcome. And I think that that will continue, given the evidence we've got today. Uh, moving on, if I may, to sort of economic crime, uh, which, of course, uh, Obama famously challenged the Chinese on and apparently got... Yeah. Uh, was, that, was that over your uh, watch? Yeah. No, it was, it, was, it was after I had left, yep. um, but you're referring to, yes. to an agreement that yes. they... So for years, we had been complaining to the Chinese about the fact they were using their national espionage assets to steal commercial secrets for their businesses. And their view for a long time was, we don't distinguish between national security and economic security. It's the same thing. Um, so we complained about it. I remember I went over to China after I'd left government, but with the Chamber of Commerce, and I said to the, some of the business people and some of the senior officials, um, you know, someday you all are going to wind up with intellectual property of real value, and you're going to become victims. So you better ask yourselves whether you really want this to continue. Anyway, what happened in, I think it was 2013, yeah. is Obama met with Xi. By then, the Chinese had some pretty significant economic actors that did have generate some real um, uh, intellectual property. Plus, there had been some indictments of PLA members who had hacked, and I think that was slightly embarrassing. So she finally admitted that, okay, we agree, we will agree that commercial spying is off limits. Now, did that stop it? No. My perception <laughs> is what happened is, though, the word went out, take it down a notch. Don't steal everything. Only steal the things that are really important. And I, my sense is there were some PLA folks who freelanced, like on their off hours, they'd work um, for businesses. And I think they were told, knock it off. Only do what you're doing if you're told to do it. So it made things somewhat better, but I'm not naive about whether it cured Yeah, I mean, this is the problem, isn't it, with any sort of international cyber agreement, right. is there'll still be pl plenty of freelancers. And the, the estimates about the number of people uh, either working for the state or freelancing in yeah. China and indeed in Russia, but still in China because of the scale of it, are huge. Um, and what is your view about what corporates should do any more than they do at the moment? I mean, you know, we have the national cyber security around in Victoria, of which we are very proud. Yes. Yeah. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, I, I'm always amazed that there are still so many corporates who have no policy. Uh, they, are no, they don't have a plan on ransomware. They haven't thought it through. I mean, again, like the public, I think that this is coming through, there's more awareness coming. But I, I, I was always trying to encourage um, our cybersecurity center to make public more the scale of the attacks that were coming in, both from state um, uh, actors and from private actors, whatever they were, so that people knew, not that we were just stopping them, but they needed to take more action. Do, was that going on in the yeah, States? Yeah, I, I agree, with, I, I'm in total agreement with that. And we've tried to do the same thing too. We've set up various mechanisms, and I think your, your example with the National Cyber Center is a very good one, where we try to do information sharing. We've tried to move over time to real-time sharing, not just uh, something done through old-fashioned email, but really machine speed sharing. I think one of the challenges we have in the United States with our, our corporate clients is often they're inundated with both problems and solutions. I kind of sometimes kid around and say, if you go to Silicon Valley, there are literally hundreds of companies that claim they are the solution for your cybersecurity problems. It's and, big they, and they all have the name Blue and Fire somewhere in the name. <laughs> That's true. And you can see if you're the CEO, you go, what do I do? I mean, I could bankrupt myself. So A, I do think that setting out some standards um, and um, the insurance industry, frankly, could be helpful here. Yes, yes. Would help to drive investment because people would then have a sense of what is sufficient. But the other thing I, I think is important is to really look at cybersecurity not as a compliance issue, but as an issue that is where the strategy is shaped around your particular assets and your particular business model. The cybersecurity challenge for a nuclear power plant is different than that for a retail store, um, because both in terms of the amount of outward facing activity and the seriousness of what you are protecting. So to me, you know, and this is something where the government has to be partners with the private sector, it is about managing expectations in a realistic way that give people a sense that they can actually make a difference. Yeah. 
Um, and that's what we're trying to do. Well, I completely agree with that. I mean, and also that it has to be a public and private partnership, partly because sometimes the expertise is in the public, is in the right. private sector, right. sometimes in the public. You have to work together on this. Um, so uh, coming back to the US, if I may, midterms coming up uh, shortly. Um, I read in the newspapers a couple of weeks ago that there'd been a meeting of the social media uh, leaders, sort of, of, of Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, to address how they thought they could stop there being interference in the midterm elections. Um, do you think that they, I don't know whether you know any more about that, whether you think that, uh, we've talked a little bit about legislation, but whether there is actually uh, an element of them trying to take a more proactive role themselves, not just for looking ahead for the future, but for the next few weeks. I, I actually think the answer to that is yes, and we've seen stories now <clears throat> about some of the companies taking down sites and making public the fact that these are emanating from St. Petersburg or their botnets. And we, you know, Microsoft had revealed that some some uh, campaigns were penetrated. Uh, Facebook is, has said this. I think they have varying degrees of competence. Uh, my sense is Facebook's actually been somewhat more capable in terms of identifying this than maybe some of the other platforms. But of course, there are myriad platforms. Now, that's not going to deal with the issue of tampering with voter databases, which are held by state and local governments. But there, I think the Department of Homeland Security is trying to work with local governments. But, but I want to say this. You've got to look at the attack surface here more broadly. It's not just the information operations. It's not just the attack on the voter databases, but it's also things that might affect the surrounding circumstances. So for example, if all of a sudden transportation was knocked out on election day and people couldn't get to the polls, that would be a problem. If there was an issue where power went out and the polling stations couldn't stay open, that would be a problem. I will tell you a story that I heard, you know, you read about a little over a year ago this incident in Charlottesville, Virginia, where you had you know, right-wing neo-Nazis and left-wing anti-fascists went at it, and there was violence, and a woman got killed. And if, in talking to people who were involved in that, social media was used to, to drive uh, both sides to kind of you know, elevate their presence and get in the same space. But as troubling, I was told by somebody that when they decided they needed to put a curfew in effect, all of a sudden, their communications went down. And they didn't have the ability to communicate the curfew to the members of, of law enforcement to the public. I, I can't attribute that to anybody. But my experience dealing with terrorists, where you often get a one-two punch, tells me that we need to be thinking broadly about attacks that would not just be directly at the voting process itself, but at other infrastructure that is necessary to support that process. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that. Um, I hope that our security services do look at that. The, the difference, of course, between that and what we were talking about earlier is that it's visible. What particularly worries uh, me and I think some of my colleagues is that interference in elections is invisible. Right. And then you get a certain outcome and you have no idea to what degree it's been, um, you know, been changed by people interfering in it. And I think that's the most insidious. Yes, now we, the good news here is, <clears throat> at least in the US, most voting machines are offline except very briefly after they've been um, collected the votes. And most of them, and we'd like all of them to be in this category, generate a paper ballot. So um, even though the counting is done off the electronic ballot, if there's any question, you can go back and manually count. I actually worry more about databases corrupted, so people think they can vote and they're told they can't. <clears throat> even that can be corrected because you have provisional voting. But I think what the Russians did in the Ukraine several years ago during a presidential election, they tried to hack into a news organization that was putting out results in order to change the results to show the Russian pro-Russian candidate won. Yeah. Now, they knew eventually the truth would come out. But you see, if there was a, a division of outcome, then people could say, well, how do you know what to believe? And you know, much of the game plan with the Russians is there is no truth. No. You can't believe yeah. anybody. Yeah. That's exactly right. And that's what they were trying to do over the script piles and have done subsequently on issues is just create this fog, fog of mistrust around yeah. it where people then do go out and say, well, you know, is it true? Isn't it? Are you sure? And they ask for high levels of evidence, which is uh, more challenging. Well, Michael, thank you very much. Those are all the questions I had, although I look forward to privately asking you some more <coughs> later. Yes. Um, I hope we can uh, perhaps now consider opening it up to other people 
who might have some questions about the topics that we've been discussing. Yes, thank you. Please, could you just introduce yourself? I know who you are. Uh, Admiral please. Lord West, we, 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 we know each other. Yes. Um, uh, a very, a very, Over a, wrap, yes. a very, <laughs> a very quick one. Um, uh, the position of Huawei, ZTE, and those firms, as you know, we've allowed Huawei to be very much become very much part of our infrastructure. Now we're looking at going towards 5G. Really, we can only achieve that, allowing Huawei and these other companies, Chinese companies, to be involved. How do you see that, bearing in mind the US have a very different view towards that? How great do you think this risk is? And do you think there's any way of us ameliorating that risk, bearing in mind of how far down track we've gone? Now, we, we do take a different view. Um, we have, you know, the, the US government has communicated to the major telephone and ISPs that they don't think Huawei or ZTE products ought to be routers or servers or in any of the critical infrastructure. I think the phones are a little less of an issue, but anything that's really part of the, of the basic infrastructure, uh, the concern is this, is the hardware or software, does it have a vulnerability? Often the answer we get is, well, you can look at all this, but the challenge is you get updates and you get repairs. And the reality is you can't necessarily monitor all of that. Even with, with well-meaning uh, companies that are Western companies, you get flaws and vulnerabilities. Uh, I, know, I know the Australians have absolutely ruled out using this. I think you know, the way to mitigate it at this point is at least to kind of move them more to the periphery than the center. And then to also uh, pay close attention to how updates are managed and how repairs are managed. Um, Certainly with respect to critical government systems and intelligence community systems, I mean, I, you know, we would never allow um, uh, Huawei or ZTE on our, on our government systems. This has come up also with Kaspersky. Um, Kaspersky antivirus uh, is an interesting story in the news. And I emphasize it was in the news, so it's public. Which is that some very sensitive tools from the government were stolen, online tools were stolen. And as far as the report went, it was somebody who brought them home, which they never should have done. But it's not that they deliberately turned them over to others. It's that they had, were running Kaspersky antivirus. And the essence of antivirus is it looks in your data to see if there is malware. And if you have malicious tools you brought home, bingo, they're going to find it. And that all gets circulated back to Moscow. So. That's problematic. And um, I think that, you know, we may get to the point that for the most sensitive systems, you want to have a cradle to grave, chip to finished product prominence for your technology. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. It was very interesting. Yes. Uh, Gavin McNichol, uh, once perhaps a co founder of a company that might have been called Blue and or Fire, but um, <laughs> anyway. Um, do you think there's a, a, a view um, of the, the, the legal environment for private sector companies um, that could become more permissive in their ability to defend themselves? I'm thinking particularly about uh, the cyber intelligence companies now serving. Are you thinking about, about the, what they sometimes call hacking back? Uh, so hacking back is uh, a, a, an argument advanced by some companies that when you're attacked, you should be able to defend yourself, not just by defending your own network, but if your data is stolen, you should be able to go back and get it back again, and maybe to disable the server that was used to launch the attack. Um, in my view, and I think you probably of most people in, in the US that are working in this area, uh, this is not a good idea. <laughs> because first of all, uh, it probably violates a lot of laws. But putting that to one side, um, often the server which launched the attack it, you know, it, it hopped through a number of different points. And the risk of taking down a server that has a, an impact on innocent people uh, is rather high. And so now you respond and you, not, you don't just take out the bad guy, but you take out hospitals or schools or things of that sort. You can also escalate things. And all of a sudden what was a relatively confined attack, if the response gets too hot, you then get a response that escalates it further. It's a little bit like if someone robs your house, burglarizes your house, I think this is true in both countries, you don't get to go to their house and get your stuff back. 
you have to call the police. And I think that's kind of what the, what the rule is, should be in cyber as well. Yeah. Kevin, have you been hacking back? Oh, yeah, I think, I think you are certainly free within your network absolutely to surveil. Um, whether you can penetrate another network to surveil, I mean, it's less fraught than the issue of actually doing damage, but it's probably going to violate if you're dealing with a foreign uh, uh, entity, but even a domestic entity in the U.S., it's probably going to violate a law. And again, it's going to be very hard to limit what you're surveilling. Now, what I think you can do uh, is contact the authorities, and then they have the ability, and they can deputize you and supervise you in doing the surveillance. So there's nothing wrong with being um, uh, not a privateer, but being uh, a private sector actor that is deputized by the government to carry out an operation with appropriate supervision. But I think you have to get the government authority in there at some point. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, John, uh, John Scarlett. Uh, R Russia and the elections um, is an immediate current issue. Um, and we have been talking a bit about, uh, even let's say with uh, China uh, three years ago, how when they became too exposed and yeah. there was too much controversy, they stepped back a bit, at least for a while. So you could argue that maybe we could expect something similar from the Russians because there has been a certain controversy about it. Uh, what is your understanding, Michael, of you know the situation as of now? I mean, do you have an understanding of uh, how it's coming across? You know, how how intense the level of interference in the midterms <laughs> looks like being and, and so on? I think, I think it's going to be um, pretty intense. I know there's, by the way, an election in Sweden, I think on Sunday. And I was told when I was over there that the Twitter traffic for the extreme right-wing party far exceeds all the traffic for all the other parties. And of course, they're assuming that's not an accident. So I, I think we're going to see a step up in this. Now, there'll be one difference in the 2016 election, that was a national election. Um, although we have every member of Congress is up for re-election, the reality is, and this is where data analytics is, a, is a, a tool that can be misused, there are probably 20 to 30 districts that are actually competitive. The rest of them are, you know, it would take a miracle to change the outcome. So I would imagine what you'll get is a more targeted use of social media and misbehavior, but not one that is uh, necessarily aimed at national figures. So that may be more difficult to detect because not, you may not have the sophistication to understand why a particular figure is being, is being attacked. In, um, in the federal government or in state um, uh, governments, given that it's divided, who has the power and the responsibility uh, to be monitoring that? It's really the state government or the local government. And the federal government has been offering assistance. Initially, many of the states said no. Now, I think I was told uh, over the summer that pretty much every state is at least getting some cybersecurity advice from the federal government. But I'm, I'm quite sure there are differing levels of capability and we don't have a lot of time. So I think the expectation is, and I think the intelligence community has publicly stated this, is that we are seeing and going to see more tampering in the run-up to the election. I mean, what's interesting, uh, one of the things I find interesting about tampering in elections is that what happens is, uh, we have evidence so far, is that tampering is revealed sometime after the election has taken place, and obviously the results stand. The really interesting thing would be to catch people tampering at the time, so that it's you know has has the sort of infl it doesn't isn't able to have the influence it would otherwise have. Yeah, and I do think they did. You know, we had public announcements by a number of the tech companies that they have found, for example, intrusions into campaigns and things of that sort. Which, by the way, is not new. We've had that for years. What changed again in 2016 was that it wasn't just espionage, which is you know common, but it was actually then disseminating this as a way of actually what we call doxing.
to try to actually affect the outcome. And I think we've seen some efforts at that coming up even in the upcoming election. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, yes. Hi there, I'm Omar, I work for an MP. Um, particularly a question for Amber, if that's oh, What's okay. your name? Omar, sorry. Omar, work for an MP. Um, you mentioned that some companies may not be up to scratch with their um, cybersecurity and ransomware and stuff like that. Do you think that the cybersecurity centre has enough teeth? And also, what is the role in f for government and any shortfalls in legislation for them to, to step in um, if their protocols aren't up to scratch? Well, we, in the UK, we have a big outreach programme from the National Cybersecurity Centre. And we have uh, a number of private, largest, larger private sector companies that lend people into the center to make sure that we have the right reach out to the private sector. So there's quite a strong partnership, quite a lot of you know, reach out to the companies, organizations like the CBI, the IOD, to make sure that we give as much assistance as possible. And increasingly, uh, some of the regulators of companies are saying, and we need to know, that you've got a cyber policy in place like you would expect people to have some sort of financial regulation policy in place. So I feel it's getting embedded, but actually checking it and making sure that it happens is harder. Sorry, if, if government sees that a company isn't um, up to scratch, do you think that they already have enough powers to step in? Well, uh, we've had several examples of some companies being a little bit reluctant to reveal that they've had uh, incursions, shall we say, because the shareholders view it very dimly. Uh, but I think there is now more uh, awareness, and also I, can't, I think if it's more self-preservation as well, because the people, can, people who run these companies, particularly these large sort of retail, banking, sometimes telephone companies, have now got confidence, I believe, in the cybersecurity and be able to help them. So the experience that we've getting now is that they're contacted much more quickly at the beginning so that they can help secure it. So I think it's working because it's a service that people need. So I don't see at the moment any particular need for more legislation. Yes, any more questions? Paddy, were you going to ask us a question here, I think? Sorry. <coughs> so if I may, I'm, I'm very struck by the conversation you had about the First Amendment. Um, and in particular, I'm just uh, hyper aware of um, leaving Russia and China aside of actually, if you like, within Western ranks, there being quite significant differences between, let's say, what the Congress of the United States would tolerate and think of doing, uh, either through legislation or, or through other f forms of influence, what the United Kingdom would think of doing, and Amber, you had great success in getting these companies to move along by roughing them up a bit, which was to the good in my mind, because uh, it, it does. <laughs> well, it seems we've had the uh, desired effect. I'm not sure we would have got where we wanted to if you hadn't. And then what the European Union is doing, uh, not least where there are um, perhaps slightly collectivist views, uh, and also ones that refer to something which we've heard. President Macron talk about data sovereignty. And I just wonder if you could just pick over the, those for us, because it seems to me the European Union is going a particular way. There is discussion of it being a regulatory superpower mm. in this area. I mean, you know, that's a, you know, one of the challenges, and, and you know, full disclosure, Patty and I have, have you know, discussed and worked on this issue between the US and the United Kingdom. Um, you know, our laws are within borders. Our data is not. And data usually, particularly with the cloud, is parked somewhere which from an engineering standpoint is a good location to have power, water, you know, relatively benign weather, like Ireland, for example. Yes. And um, the challenge is sometimes when a court in one country wants to get lawful access to data, uh, they go to a company, the company says, well, here's the problem. The data is not here. The data is in Ireland or somewhere else. And the court says, well, great, we want it. And the company says, wait a second you have to go to a court in the other country. That creates sometimes inconsistent rulings. Um, we've managed with our countries to come up with an agreement to, to rationalize that. But it's a feature of a larger issue. So the Europeans have a right to be forgotten. And that means if you don't like a story about you, you can go to European authorities and you can say, I want to have this off the search engine. Um, and what, ha what's hap what happened initially under that law is if you went to the court and the court granted you that, you know, kind of, I have to say, somewhat Orwellian revision of history, that would be limited to the sites that were within the, that particular country or within Europe. 
But now I gather, I don't know if it's been resolved yet, there's a claim that actually that should be global. So that would mean if someone didn't like a story about them, and I'm not saying let's put aside falsity and let's put aside children. That, that can be a different category. An adult doesn't like a true but unflattering story, um, and they get a court to say it should be off the search engine, that would in theory be enforced against the company in the United States. So then people in the United States say, say well, wait a second. Um, we're an independent country. We have a First Amendment. And our citizens have a right to see true news. And we don't agree with this. So I do think one of the challenges we're facing is how to um, reconcile uh, 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 laws that are based on sovereignty with data that's global in the way it actually operates. Yeah. The good news is, as I said, with the US and the UK, we worked this out with respect to lawful yeah. access. The truth is we tend to be uh, easiest in working out with the so-called five eyes, yeah. which have a common legal tradition. It gets harder when you start to deal with some of the continental countries, and of course, harder yet in Russia and China. Yeah. Paddy, do you want to follow up on anything on that? Um, I think you're being very generous. Yes. I think you're being very generous to our European partners. I mean, I just don't think they share our, our conception of how we might resolve this and resolve this in a way which will go with the grain of the First Amendment and the Congress. Well, and there may be, a, you know, one of the challenges may be that there's an impulse on the part of some of the European countries to say, well, we want then our citizens' data to be held in our country. Mm -hmm. Now, that would have a very bad effect because it would tend to fragment and also make the Internet less efficient. A cynic might say sometimes the impulse to insist on that is more economic than it is based on, on you know, concerns about you know, people's personal dignity because obviously that, that shifts business to the local provider of storage services and not the big Amazons and the whatevers. Um, on the other hand, um, and you see the, the, the classic example of this is China, as we've talked about. The question is whether in the long run that will impose a cost on the on a country that tries to pursue that such that they will have to rethink that and i think that's a big challenge i mean my experience in working uh representing the uk in the eu was that many of the uk eu countries were much more <coughs> cautious about data than european countries particularly the ones like ourselves who'd experienced high levels of terrorism. Right. There's nothing like a high level of terrorism to make you realize that actually you do need to have better access yeah. to data. But there were some really strong, sort of long-held philosophical reasons in some countries as to not to share that data. I mean, Germany's judges, for instance, in the court was one of those not wanting to share those data. And we would have substantial arguments. And sometimes, you know, the representative from Europol would say, I know that children can be kept safer if we can have access to that data. I can map how safe children are around Europe by being able to, able to have access to that data. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, we did it. We had a, when I was in office, um, we, we uh, determined that passenger name record information, which is very minimal information about, you know, your travel itinerary, who paid for your ticket, your contact number, your home residence, you know, passport number that you could actually use that to draw linkages. If we'd gone back and used it with the hijackers on 9-11, we would have connected 15 of the 19, not only to each other, but to actually known terrorists in the Middle East. So we insisted we wanted to get this from flights coming into Europe. The EU resisted for a long time. Finally, we said, you know, we're not really giving you a choice. If you <laughs> want to land, we want this. Um, now, though, because in the wake of some of the terrible things we've seen in the last couple of years in Europe with foreign fighters, Europe has a PNR program yeah. with its own borders. So I agree with you, Amber. I think that, unfortunately, um, to kind of paraphrase Dr. Johnson, a few terrorist bombs have a clarifying effect on the mind. They, they really do. They really do. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paddy. Um, any other questions from our uh, audience? Yes, gentlman here. Hi there, my name is uh, Jonathan Brinson. I, I was just thinking about, um, I wondered if you had any observations about freedom of speech and whether it's being compromised potentially by stealth in the sense that um, you're seeing some of the big social media uh, platforms deplatform various sort of outspoken commentators under the sort of banner of hate speech. And is there a sense that they are, you know, fearing regulation 
and potentially being leaned on by government to sort of clean up their act and deplatforming people without any due process at all under a very hazy kind of definition. Whereas, as you were saying before, um, the government in similar circumstances would have to have a very specific basis on which to, um, uh, on which to you know, uh, take that right away. Well, I mean, that's a very interesting question because um, you know, we've talked a little bit about how with fake news and trolling, uh, the social media companies have gotten much more active in trying to take down sites that they believe are being manipulated or are really botnets. But part of that has also become taking down what they view as speech that violates the terms of service. Uh, like you can't have hate speech, you can't bully people. Now, uh, you know, these are not government agencies, so they don't technically have to live by the First Amendment, which only applies to the government, does not apply to the private sector. But what you are starting to see now is complaining, particularly from very conservative folks, maybe spilling into further right than conservative, who claim they're being silenced. And I actually think Donald Trump recently tweeted uh, complaining about Google shutting down some of these sites. Now, I will tell you, some of the sites that are being sh shut down, I mean, we, there are some crazy people out there. And they have some, <laughs> you know, I mean, there was a terrible situation where there's some bizarre conspiracy called um, for uh, Quan or something like that. I forget what it's called. But anyway, these people believe that there's a secret, a mega um, child molestation and trafficking ring, and, they, and that Hillary Clinton was involved with it, and that there was a pizza parlor in Northwest Washington that was mm -hmm. the center of this. Mm -hmm. And some guy goes in with a gun yes. to, to you know, find out for himself, and happily no one got killed. So um, I, I understand why the platforms say, look, we don't want to be responsible for someone getting killed or violence. And they can do that because they're not government agencies. But you know, again, the challenge becomes someone's going to complain. And then there's always another site. And a lot of what happens is this goes underground into the, into the deep web where the people who have these you know, uh, chat rooms, which are very hard to find, but the people who are interested know where they are. And they communicate that way. And one of the arguments you hear is better to have it visible and know what's going on than to have it invisible. And this, you know, as Amber will know, the trade-off between shutting something down <clears throat> and losing visibility versus keeping the visibility but having it operate is, is a major um, challenge for people in the security field. Anything, anything, anything else you want to add, Jonathan? You say that there are other platforms, but I, I suppose the percentages are quite frightening regarding you know the vo how many people get their news through a very you know three um, yes. uh, platforms Sites, true. and if those platforms which are private companies have the right to determine what is hate speech without any due process at all isn't that a concern it is i mean uh, I, you know as i said i mean our law doesn't uh, oddly um, the law actually works the other way in the us in the sense that a newspaper uh, gets to have a First Amendment right of editorial control. So if the New York Times doesn't want to run a letter or run a story, actually they have a First Amendment right not to be forced to do it. So what's happened now is I think the social media companies have moved from pretending they are like the telephone company. They're just pipes and wires and they're nothing to do with it, to acknowledging they are, in effect, like the news media. At, but that means that they, their editorial decision making um, becomes protected. And that would make it actually difficult for the government to insist that they conduct in a certain way. Now, you know, the argument, and you saw this in the mass media, is eventually if a particular platform is too constrained, uh, there'll be a competitor. And um, people will migrate to the competitor. And we, uh, we saw that in the television world in the United States where we have multiple stations now. But um, yeah, I understand there are some, um, some complaints about whether the platforms are now going too far in the other direction, not just in dealing with you know, uh, bot, botnets and trolls, but simply dealing with, politically, with political opinions that they, the owners and the workers 
find unpleasant. And that's, I think, part of the great challenge for all of our societies is we've gotten so fraught between people who disagree politically, not being able to engage at all with each other, that now everything becomes a battle. And, and, and we've got to figure out that's a social issue, not just a legal issue. I would defend the right of anybody to write a well-argued, hateful philosophy on some, some, some argument that I really don't agree with. But what I do think that we have to hold the social media companies to account for is pure hate speech. Uh, I hate comments, you know, and that we have seen so much of an escalation of that. And, you know, as a politician, I have had some experience of that. And I think it's, it's, it's not something we should put up with, that every MP I know has uh, thousands of emails and Facebook comments and Twitter comments about personal nasty things about them. I know, I, I know most, I believe that most MPs, I can't verify this completely, but most of us have had some sort of death threats. Um, uh, you know, a lot of them have had to have prosecutions in their constituencies for people who have sent them death threats. One of the consequences of the many benefits of social media is that there is a proliferation of hate out there. And I do think that we need to hold the social media companies accountable for making sure that there is less of that. I think, by the way, an interesting dimension we didn't talk about <clears throat> as we talk about terrorism and particularly inspired terrorism, and I'm not just talking about jihadi terrorism, I mean extreme right, extreme left, is it's remarkable to me how many of these people advertise what they're going to do on social media. And something I would like to see the media do is alert the authorities when someone says, I'm going to go kill a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not uh, you know, tough intelligence to collect, but you've got to get it to the people who can take action on it. And I think we're getting into an, uh, an age now when I fear the volatility of our politics, at least in the US, is going to lead to an increase in violence from a number of different sources. And it's not the kind of stuff that your traditional spies and satellites can find, because it's not going to be in the Hindu Kush. It's going to be domestic. And social media will turn out to be, I think, a very fertile area for warning. So we need to get the companies to think about that. Yeah. Paddy, that's something from your experience. So I, I really just wanted to just steer you a little bit towards the question of presence. So um, uh, often when we speak, and we have today, we talk about terror um, contents, whether that be um, child exploitation, whether that be terrorism, whether it be hate speech, we talk about contents. What is really striking is that uh, Islamic State, and indeed abusers now, manipulators online, for them there's very little distinction between the content that they put up and their presence. And anybody I mean, who's a digital native who uses Instagram or one of the other platforms knows this, the fact that you're reading something put up by, by a terrorist group or a child molester means you're also in contact with them. And actually what they put up can be innocuous, but the effect of it can be that you are drawn in in the way that Michael was just saying and that you're sucked in. There's a very striking dichotomy between what the companies are willing to do about uh, even child sexual exploitation, but um, certainly uh, terrorism and hate speech, where they are resistant to removing users and saying, no, you may not be present on our network, but we'll look at your content. Yeah. And what they'll do about malware and things that affect their bottom line, so cyber issues, where they're all too ready, not only to remove it if they find it traveling across their networks, but also actually to make sure that the person who put, or the body that put it on in the first place isn't allowed on their network anymore, and they actually automate that, and they actually um, buffer it. So something turns up, they think it's malware, they buffer it, it never gets on, it can never get distributed, as opposed to Islamic State, which gets <coughs> on, yes. and then we're asking them to remove it, but the damage is already done. Yes. So I wonder how we shift the debate on from this slightly limiting debate about content, which gets us into First Amendment issues and into the question of presence, when we know the companies are making choices about who's on their Well, and I, you know, I think what we have seen, at least in the US, so interesting. Yeah. recently, is there has been a bit of a move to, uh, you, you, you know, in baseball we have like three strikes, you're out. For certain people on the internet to say, if they violate the policy two or three times, they, they lose their account. And I think there's some complaining by one of these conspiracy guys who complained that they yanked his, his Twitter account. Um, and, but then, of course, you get the argument, well, you're not letting people you disagree with speak. So that's the argument you're going to get. I think that, as we, as we said with the Russians, I have less 
of a problem, if someone violates the rules, um, then I, I have less of a problem with banning them at that point or banning their account because these companies do lay down terms of service. It's not a like ev open to everybody and Katie bar the door. Um, again, but you do get into interesting issues about whether they are being even handed. And I think yes. what they're wrestling with now is um, how do they come up with a process to adjudicate these things that at least is relatively fair and doesn't look like it's tipped because of the unconscious or even conscious uh, prejudices of the people who are running the companies. But uh, um, I think taking the terrorists off <coughs> should be a, a relatively easy um, obligation. It, when you get into people whose political views are hateful, for the reasons Amber said, <coughs> um, unless they're actually threatening or inciting, if they're, you know, um, I mean, take someone who says, you know, for example, all the intelligence community is the deep state and they're all trying to overthrow the elected officials. I mean, that is a crazy argument. But is it something you could say violates the terms of service or is it within the bounds of discourse? That gets to be a hard question. Uh, some uh, uh, a gentleman at the back here for the final question. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, uh, Jimmy Chen, Meritus Consultants. Uh, one of my uh, observations of uh, sort of social media companies dealing with uh, whether it's bots or trolls is that sometimes they end up um, just catching sort of innocent people, innocent accounts in the net. You know, some some people um, when they tweet can tweet content um, whether it's pro-Trump or sort of defending Russia, which is sort of very similar to what comes out um, of these of these bot accounts, but essentially, you know, they, they are real people with, with their own opinions, which you know, they are entitled to have. And also another um, another thing I've I've seen is that a lot of accounts, sort of Russian language accounts, which just tweet in Cyrillic, um, again, you know, just, just people going about their business end up getting caught in the net because, you know, all of a sudden this algorithm says, oh, these, these guys uh, are exhibiting behavior um, like automated accounts. Well, and I think that, um, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe part of this process as it matures will have to be the right of redress. If you feel you are, you know, unfairly being blocked, to be able to go to an ombudsman and say, you know, why was I blocked, and, and at least argue your case, because it is a, it is a difficult balance, and it is true for some of the social media platforms. Not only are they dominant because of the network effect, but in some cases, you can't even, you know, you could be going to school, and the school could be saying to you, well, the way you're going to get your class assignments and your readings is you have to go on the Facebook page of your professor, and they'll be posted there. You don't have a choice then. You've got to be able to engage with Facebook, and that and that creates a fairness issue. So, I still think we're feeling our way to this. Um, we don't want to have it just be the wild west, but we do need to have some backstopping for fairness. I think. Thank you. Well, we are feeling our way to it, and this is a wonderful contribution to the debate, Michael. Um, reclaiming our cybersecurity in the digital age. It's just a reminder in that title that we all need to be engaged in this process yeah. and not just sleepwalk, as you put it, into a situation where our minds are being controlled for us. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, interested to see that the, the French yesterday, when they went back to term, have banned smartphones in the schoolroom from aged 15 and under, which I think is quite a, quite a smart, bold thing to do. So can I wrap up by thanking you all very much for yes. joining us here today and thank Michael for his fantastic participation. Thank you.